You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is Episode 107, covering the week of February 5th through February 9th, 2018. Glad to have you back on the program. Glad to be here. Before we get started, the usual housekeeping. Please follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. Like us on Facebook at Abbeville Institute, and you can subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville INST. If you don't want to go out and search for all those things, you can go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll find all of our social media buttons, as, long as, our, as, as well as our Amazon Smile button. If you click on that Amazon Smile button every time you shop at Amazon, you'll be kicking some change back to the Abbeville Institute. Also, while you're at our webpage, you can give us an email address, and we'll give you a free ebook. Kirkpatrick Sales Emancipation Hell, and you'll get our Daily Dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. Also remember that we exist on your generous contributions alone. They are tax deductible, so if you want to help the Abbeville Institute, help keep the podcast going, help keep the website, help us put together our programs, you can go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll see a button that says support. Under that, you'll have memberships for individuals. And for as little as $3 a month if you're a student or $5 a month if you're not a student, you can help us. Or you can give us an annual contribution, $25 if you're a student, $50 if you're not. And, of course, you can give more than that if you would like to as well. Also, I just want to remind you, our conference is coming up in about two weeks, February 24th in Charleston, South Carolina. You can still register for that conference. So please go on out to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. All the information is available in the middle of the page. We'd love to see you at the concert. Ben Cooter Jones is our featured speaker, our banquet speaker on Saturday night. So you want to come out and check that out. It's on Confederate monuments and what the attack on those monuments means for America moving forward. All right. Well, we had a really good week at the Abbeville Institute this week. A lot of interesting articles, I think. And um, there were a couple of different themes going on this week. One was the idea of how it used to be appropriate in public places and mass media to be pro-South or even pro-Confederate. And that was the case all the way through the 1970s, really into the 1980s. Uh, But beginning probably in the 1990s, you saw a rather uh, concerted attack on that particular uh, part of Southern identity, the symbols of the South. And also, being Southern was now, you had to be critical of Southerners. So um, we had a couple of pieces on that. Uh, we also had a piece on Southern humor, which I think is really interesting. And then we had uh, a uh, nice piece on a book review, or a book review of a, of a, a book that has to do with Southern politics. So we'll get into all this stuff, but let's start with this idea of how it used to be uh, acceptable, even desirable, to be Southern when it came to pop culture. And so the first piece of the week we started, it was entitled In the Eye of the Beholder by our resident Japanese scholar, uh, Jack Marcourt. And he begins, Once upon a time in America, in a far different and far more gentle age, it was possible for four young men from Memphis, Tennessee, to appear at a performance in a northern city dressed as Confederate officers and sing a song entitled Save Your Confederate Money Boys, The South Shall Rise Again, without being booed off the stage. And he says, you know, not only that, rather than their performance at the 1956 International Quartet Singing Contest in Minneapolis, Minnesota, being met by a mob of screaming, placard-carrying protesters, the quartet, the Confederates, became that year's gold medal winners. And he says, this is amazing because, um, you know, these things were entirely acceptable. He says, but in today's politically correct and racially charged society, anything that relates to the Confederacy from songs, memorial statues and flags to place names, T-shirts and bumper stickers, well, they've become problematic. He says, even in the Confederate's home state of Tennessee, there is now a theater in Asheville that has felt it politically expedient to cause the annual showing of a highly acclaimed Academy Award-winning film to be, like the movie's title, Gone with the Wind. And so this is something we've been talking about on this podcast, gosh, since we started it, right? I mean, um, we began this podcast 
a little over two years ago, before the summer of 2015. But still, at that point, we were talking about the politically correct attack on the South. It just has increased exponentially since the summer of 2015. And again, this is not new. Beginning in the 1990s, early 1990s, you started seeing a much more concentrated effort on Southern symbols and things that uh, were always left alone before that point. Um, but it used to be, as he gets into this, this Confederate memorabilia, all these things, uh, and also the ability to appear pro-Southern in public, these things were not always so discouraged. And one thing I do like about this piece, at the end of the piece we actually had a a video, a tribute video to the Confederates. Um, and this was recently produced. And so people still, there are still people out there, even in just you know everyday life, that are not necessarily listening to this podcast or um, donating to the Institute that think, yeah, I mean, the South is all right. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't really care about that. In fact, when you look at polling data, um, more Americans are in favor of leaving Confederate statues and symbols where they are than taking them down. But that could be changing as we look at younger generations coming through and older generations passing away. So that's why we exist here at the Institute, to try to ensure that there is still a voice out there, even among younger people, who uh, want to keep these things around. And it's not, you know, oftentimes that's them portrayed as being uh, a racial situation. It's not at all. Uh, in fact, I think it's the exact opposite for most people. Um, he gets into Confederate memorabilia and, and uh, paraphernalia and um, how uh, these things were much more uh, available back in the 1950s and, and beyond and, uh, than they are today. Um, so... This really is a problem, though, as these things, you know, as we're going to talk about another piece this week, as these things start to become equated with, you know, Nazi symbols and all these, we've had pieces on here about, you know, who are the real Nazis in this situation. As these things are, are demonized in ways that no American ever thought they would be, and I think that's the situation People are now saying that Confederate symbols, the Confederacy in general, and the people that fought for it, Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, the common Confederate soldier, they're not American. They're un-American. What they were doing in 1861 was un-American. And when you start from that position, it's very easy to take these things down and put them away. Or it said, we'll put them in a museum. Well, even there, things aren't safe. Or put them in a cemetery, even there. They're not safe. So Jack concludes, Once one, one then wonders if such differences can ever be resolved, and all Americans can once again just sit back, relax, and enjoy performance by a group such as the Confederates. To do this, however, those who now wish to expunge the Confederacy from their history books would have to actually study such volumes written by authors in both camps, and then they might conceivably be able to grasp the simple fact that the unfortunate rattling of slavery's chains and the and the stain of racial, ethnic, and religious bigotry are not sounds and sights unique to the South, but have been an integral part of American history since our nation's very inception. And this is the comprehensive view of the past, something that we've done a lot of here, too, in the study of the Deep North. And understand that everything that the South embodied was really American, the whole idea of self-determination, the whole idea of secession was actually first trumpeted in the North. And so if we can do that, we can. it's a, it's a reconciliation message. You know, these things, all of these things, symbols, monuments, things like the Confederates, these, this barbershop quartet, all of that stuff is a process of reconciliation, of recognizing the South as a distinct place and Southerners as a distinct people. And embracing that diversity. But that's not what the cultural Marxist attack or the politically correct attack on the South is all about. It's about eliminating that entirely. 
creating a oneness in American culture which has nothing to do with traditional America at all. And that's unfortunate because when you purge the South, you purge what was America. And I've said on this podcast several times, you know, the South is America. The, the Jeffersonian tradition was America for 80 years. And uh, that's now being removed. Um, there was an article the other day that I saw about how, the, and this was seen as, you know, well, we're not doing this to get rid of Thomas Jefferson in this politically correct world. But of course, the St. Louis Arch, which uh, had Thomas Jefferson's name attached to it, now has been removed. Jefferson's name has been removed. And the, this was done by almost unanimous consent in the Congress. And it was, they said, not because Jefferson has come under attack, but because nobody knows it as the uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, Park. I can't remember what the official name was. I know it is the Gateway Arch, so that's we're just going to call it that. And Okay, but uh, and they say well, you know, the park is going to have more Jefferson than it ever had before. But the, the concern is that when you take Jefferson's name off of it, uh, you, you minimize the role that Jefferson played in the Louisiana Purchase, the Lewis and Clark Expedition, and everything else that goes along with that. And, of course, Jefferson being a slaveholder, this is the, this is the time we live in. The question is going to be asked because of the effort across the United States to get rid of anything that has to do with slaveholders. And, of course, by doing that, you're going to have to get rid of a lot of American history. And, um, you know, so that's, uh, there was an article, uh, again, this, this, uh, this politically correct assault is not just here in America. There was an article in the Irish, in an Irish newspaper about getting rid of a statue uh, dedicated to uh, John Mitchell, who was an Irish Confederate, and, or at least contextualizing it, this is what they do here in Ireland, you know, putting up a big plaque saying this is, um, uh, you know, he was a pro-slavery guy, um, Great for Irish history, but he was, you know, stained by slavery. Well, okay. I mean, you can go out and do your own research on this and, and find out that's who he was. But he was also an important uh, hero in Ireland. And so, you know, where do you stop with these things? Where does contextualization stop? Or where does the uh, effort to remove these statues stop? And this is something that this is very Stalinistic. And so, you know, that term Stalin is thrown around. Well, it is. I mean, this is, this is by, the, by the left in, in terms of, you know, what's going on with the Trump administration, for example. It's Stalinistic. Well, it's, it's Stalinistic to remove statues. And art, just because you don't necessarily agree with the position of those Americans at the time. And so the piece on Thursday was Purging Graveyards for Progress, written by Christopher Carter. And he talks about how in Wisconsin there's a graveyard there that has several... Uh, tomb, several uh, you know, internments of Confederate soldiers who were who died in Wisconsin and were buried there. Um, it's Forest Hill Cemetery in Madison, Wisconsin. So they were at Camp Randall, which was an awful place, and then they were supposed to go to Camp Douglas, which was an equally awful place. And these men died, and so they were buried in the cemetery. And there's a there's a monument there to these Confederate soldiers. Here we have some Confederate soldiers, you know, buried here long, you know, far from home, and now there's an effort to remove the plaque and the monument honoring these Confederate soldiers. So not even a monument in a cemetery honoring the men that are there is safe. I mean, this is what it often said. Well, we got to just put these things in cemeteries. That's that's where they got to go because you know if it's really about just dead men and soldiers and remembering these soldiers, we'll put it in a cemetery or put it in a museum. But now, as we're seeing, not even these places are safe. They're not safe at all because it's the Confederacy. We've seen in Boston there was a, a monument to some Confederate soldiers or in Massachusetts who had died uh, there. That's now been covered up. Uh, so, it, 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 even if it's just something as innocuous, it seems, as saying, here lies some dead Confederate soldiers far away from home. We need to remember these people. No, you can't even do that. You can't even do that. That is uh, that is not allowed. That's not acceptable. So, this is... This is the, the situation we're in, and as he uh, Christopher Carter concludes his piece, the great poet-priest of the South, Father 
Abram J. Ryan once remarked that only the dead are the free, and he says it is a damning day when one must even question that. And it's it's true, you know, where where are we today? The peace on Friday again, uh, the free, peace on Friday and Wednesday kind of work together, um, both having to deal with Southern humor and also uh, Southern pop culture, and and so you know we we wrestled with that on Monday as well, but. Uh, the piece on the piece on Friday is uh, entitled Gator McCluskey, written by yours truly, and it's it's about uh, Burt Reynolds, whose birthday is February 11th, so this week, and he's going to be 82 years old. But back in the 70s, uh, it was considered to be cool to be Southern. I mean, everyone wanted to be that, and some of that had to do with um, the fact that pop culture was so influenced by the South in the 70s, music with. Uh, Southern music like Leonard Skinner and Charlie Daniels and the Allman Brothers Band. And then uh, you had um, e- even the Motown sound was influenced by the South. And Hank Williams Jr. and down, you know, on down the line, you had Jimmy Carter elected president in 1976. You had uh, his brother uh, Billy with his uh, uh, redneck power brand and Billy Beer. Um, and in film, you had Burt Reynolds. And uh, so you had Smokey and the Bandit in 1977, and you had you know Jerry Reed and that, and Jackie Gleason. Um, and at the time, and, he, and he, then later you had the Dukes of Hazard. So we got Cooter Jones, but you, at the time people couldn't understand why are these things so popular? Why is this, uh, you know, this interest in the South so popular? And and Reynolds said that uh, all the films that he was involved in, a whole series of films, this is his quote, a whole series of films made in the South, about the South, and for the South. Now, these things have been disparagingly called hick flicks. You see, because you can't have a film about the South that doesn't have to do with hicks, right? Uh, and Reynolds starred in several of these. Um, he also starred in Deliverance, which is one of the worst films about Southern culture uh, that you can find. So is Easy Rider, which came out in 1969. I mean, just disparaging. But uh, when you look at some of the films that Reynolds did, things like White Lightning and Gator, which is where the title Gator McCluskey, and W.W. and the Dixie Dance Kings, uh, Smokey and the Bandit Trilogy, I mean, you look at these things, even his uh, role in The Longest Yard, he was distinctively Southern. And there was this... What was interesting about this distinctively Southern flavor in these particular films is that Reynolds appreciated the South, and you had these characters that had flaws, and these characters were skirting the law. I mean, The Longest Yard is about a football game in a prison, Uh, and you look at W.W. and the Dixie Dance Kings. Burt Reynolds is a a terrible guy, and his character is terrible. Uh, He's got Jerry Reed in it, but he's an awful guy. But he's he's able to be redeemed in the film in a way. And so when you look at that particular theme, same thing with White Lightning, Gator McCleskey, these are films about bootleggers. I mean, they're skirting the law. When you look at that particular theme, number one, they're funny at times. And so there is Southern comedy and it's humor involved in these things. But there's also a dark seriousness and as I say, you know, good Southern comedy had always contained a bit of human failing as an essential component of the Southern experience. Southern heroes aren't marble or cast iron men, and the imperfect working class hero who sometimes lives on the fringes of Yankee law or even outright rejects it is part of Southern folklore and tradition. I mean, you look at the South, and you look at, you know, just say symbols, and you have Lee and Davis. And so what you had, people are saying, well, these people are traitors. These people are traitors. And uh, they cannot be celebrated any longer. Well, that's saying, essentially, they were skirting or outright, outright rejecting what is viewed as Yankee law. And, of course, then they become the tragic hero. This is why Davidson wrote Lee in the Mountains. This is why Flannery O'Connor penned A Good Man is Hard to Find. The, the, a Good Man is Hard to Find, the the, the Main character is a terrible guy, but he's the most redeemable of the bunch. And so here you have Gator McCluskey and Bama McCall and Dixie and Leroy and Butterball and Bo and Cletus and all these people, these southern characters that you can you can recognize. But they're human. They have human failings. And so that part of it is what makes these stories interesting. 
That's what makes Southern stories and Southern characters so unique because of that. As I say, a moonshiner like Gator McCleskey could become a working class hero like Fireball Robert Roberts or Junior Johnson. I mean, these are NASCAR heroes. And so that's part of the South, this very relatable part of the South that people have always liked. And so this is where Georgia Scenes comes in, which was a wonderful collection of essays written by A.B. Longstreet in the 1830s. Now, he later you know, tried to run away from these things as he became much more involved in education uh, and uh, theology. But um, these particular stories, these Georgia scenes, this, this uh, piece, a very long piece, was written by Jim Kibler as an introduction to a, um, a collection of, uh, or a, a, another uh, reproduction of these essays. Georgia Scenes is the perfect exemplification of the South and the Southwestern frontier in the antebellum American period. And so if you lived in Georgia, if you lived in Alabama or Mississippi or Tennessee, these were your people. This is what was going on there. And they're funny. The characters, many of them, have failings. Uh, there, these would be situations that uh, we wouldn't even recognize. You know, fights and horse swaps and shooting matches and all kinds of stuff that's going on in here in, in 1835. But this was the real South at the time. And so Southerners are very good at comedy. Th these stories are funny. And they're funny because they're real, because you can relate to them. And they're funny because all of these characters have flaws. Just like you have with Gator McCluskey or, you know, Burt Reynolds. And so you, you have this important part of Southern culture that kind of, it's, it's organic, it sprouts up out of the dirt, and it's in the people themselves. And so this is why Burt Reynolds can say these films are you know, made in the South, about the South, and for the South. This particular collection of essays is made in the South, about the South, and for the South. And Edgar Allan Poe called it, you know, a wonderful book. You know, it's, it's, it's what the South was all about at the time. And so um, it's real. And as Jim Kibler says in this particular collection of stories, uh, Longstreet shows that man is capable of loyalty, honesty, kindness, modesty, and sens sensitivity, but just as likely to have propensities, usually just barely kept under control, for violence, cruelty, and extreme vanity and selfishness. Man can at times be intelligent, even wise, but just as often pig-headed, silly, short-sighted, and obtuse. He can discern or fail to discern the value of the world around him or the qualities of the people nearest him. His priorities can be admirably placid or stupidly mistaken. In essence, Longstreet, many decades before the official school of literary, literary realism in the late 19th century, had created realistic fiction far closer to the stated aims of that school than many of its of ex, of ex, excuse me, accepted authors. For unlike, for example, Stephen Crang, Longstreet did not have to overreact to the excesses of romantic idealization by overemphasizing the grim aspects of life. He instead strikes a healthy balance between human nature's higher and lower motives and thus presents us with a truer realism. That is the essence of films like Gator, White Lightning, WW, and the Dixie Dance Kings. That's the point of those. They're real. And so this is what makes this form of comedy so good. This is what makes this form of art, Southern art, so good, and why it's important to remember these things, and why this stuff was so popular at one point, because people said, yeah, those are real characters. I can relate to those people. 
But now these things are seen as politically incorrect. You couldn't get away with making a film like Burt Reynolds made in the 70s nowadays. Unless the Southern character is just the worst person on the face of the planet, and that's how they, they have to be the villain, or they have to be the stupid one in the group. I mean, this is how Southerners are portrayed in film, or they're even they're not even human anymore. Uh, you know, you look at Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Slayer. They're not even human. You can't have a real human character. Uh, even, well, I'll, I'll hold that back for a couple of weeks. We have a piece coming up next week and then one the week after that'll be rather interesting on that theme again, too. But So this is an essential component of Southern culture, this humor, this realism. And so when you look at you know Southern culture in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, and here you have the 1830s, this is why the South was so popular, because it was real, it was quaint, it was unique. It was quintessentially American. The last thing we'll talk about this week is Remember Mississippi. It's a book review by Ryan Walters. Uh, entitled the title of the book is Remember Mississippi, but Paul Gottfried wrote this review. And the story is that of uh, the 2014 Republican primary in the, in the state of Mississippi between Thad Cochran and Chris McDaniel. And, of course, Ryan Walters was, on the, was uh, in, in the uh, trenches there. He was part of that McDaniel campaign. And how this really set the stage for the uh, Trump revolution of 2016. Now, uh, Dr. Gottfried does not, doesn't see the connection as much because McDaniel's a little different than Trump, and the type of campaign he ran was a little different than Trump. wasn't as populist, much more, as, uh, as Gottfried thinks, much more uh, in line with, say, a Rand Paul than a Roy Moore or you know a, a uh, Donald Trump. But certainly it was anti-establishment, and Cochran uh, pulled out all the dirty tricks possible to keep McDaniel from getting the nomination, and Cochran had the backing of the political machine of Mississippi, uh, the establishment political machine. And so this is where Walter says that McDaniel exposed the GOP establishment and inspired a revolution. Not necessarily that he and Trump are the same, but he's exposing what was going on here in 2014, people could actually see it. You've got this upstart, and then they're going to pull out, they're going to play the race card on McDaniel, which they did. Uh, and they did this. It was dirty, dirty, dirty politics. And McDaniel didn't deserve it. Um, and so this is, this is what we're seeing now. In modern American politics, this is really where you have the grassroots South, and you've got the grassroots Midwest and the grassroots West. Uh, you've got these people out there who are not happy with re with the Republican establishment. And I think you know you, you see stories about how Republicans are retiring in droves or saying they're not coming back. Well, that's because I think they realize that uh, the, the grassroots is not necessarily with them. Uh, and of course, we saw you know what happened in in Alabama with Roy Moore, and that's because. You know, Roy Moore had some flaws. It wasn't because people supported the establishment. I think it's because they, they didn't want to get behind Roy Moore. Um, but the point is, a Roy Moore-type candidate can win if he just had just a little better, can, can win in primaries. And, and I think that we're going to see that moving forward. It's going to be more prominent moving forward. And so I think that's where, you know, when Ryan Walter says, you know, he inspired a revolution. You're exposing the, the – uh, this is muckraking in many ways. You know, this is the old process of muckraking. Show the establishment. Show these people for what they are. And you know, move away from them. And I think that's what many Americans are saying. Gosh, we don't like these dirty politicians on both sides. I mean, this is, this is uh, Bernie Sanders against Hillary Clinton. We don't like these awful people. And this is why people in the 90s started talking about term limits and other things, because they wanted the establishment out. They wanted to have fresh faces in there. They didn't want people to go into D.C. and get corrupt. And uh, that's, that's the idea behind these insurgent candidates. Get rid of the, of the establishment. Get rid of these people that are just slopping at the trough and get new people in there. And so I think that's why uh, this particular book, if you haven't read it, it's, it's very well written. 
Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, Ryan Walters is a good author. He's a good writer. And it's a really neat story about all the inner workings, what was going on in Mississippi at that time. So if you haven't picked up a copy of the book yet, I'd recommend doing it. It's not expensive. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. And it, it really helps, I think, set the stage for what's going on in the future and what might be going on in the future in 2018 and 2020 in American politics. So uh, and it has this you know, very Southern feel to it, this resistance to the establishment. Uh, which is what, again, you know, the, the Southern tradition uh, really personifies and, uh, is pers- and, and exemplifies. And so uh, that, that whole process we find uh, as we look at the Southern tradition. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed uh, this week in review at the Abbeville Institute. Until next time, good day. Good day.